It's May 2013. This is the first day's shoot of a trip from the southern tip of Africa to the northern tip of Scotland, just three days before the sponsors cancelled. Scotland. Scotland? Yeah. And whereabouts in Scotland? John O'Groats. Gee. Sorry, I'm uh, just down to get a <coughs> couple of things in the shops. Sorry, cheers. That's it. Oh. <laughs> like lucky story. John O'Groats, Scotland. There's going to be another vehicle. That was a really well kitted vehicle. Pull the other one. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and travelling to the remotest parts of the world. Well, here I am in Botswana. Two days driving from Cape Town and the fun has begun because the road, of course, is fantastically sandy. I've had to stop here and let down our tyre pressures. Now, the person doing all the work at the moment is right there and that's, that's Paul Marsh. Paul Marsh is recognized as one of the world's best overland vehicle builders and it's been my privilege to work with him for over two decades. But it was about one decade after I first met Paul that we had the chance to travel together. That was in 2013 after a failed start to drive from South Africa to Scotland after our sponsor dropped out at the last minute. We are going to travel from the southernmost tip of Africa to the northernmost tip of Scotland. So we came up with another idea and went to Botswana. Now Paul is travelling with me uh, to bring you a series of overlanding programmes. Well, you know, if, if you think about it, your tyre is actually part of your suspension. And I think most people don't get that. They put these great shocks on, these great springs, and they forget about the tyre, which actually absorbs a lot of the shock load. They approach a border with this whole idea that this is going to be a difficult experience, and I'm going to be harassed, and it's going to be annoying. And, and if you can just take your approach and swing it around, and that, that is difficult, but you go to the border, and you just look for a way to greet the guys. And I'd mix them up and I'd seal them in packs and then I would, I would have hiding places in the vehicle and I would hide money. When I needed money I could reach in, I could grab one pack and I knew I had $500 in that pack. Well, we know from driving actually that the grass is quite long in the middle here and what tends to happen with grass it gets sucked into the radiator. Land Rover, yeah. you can bolt stuff to the sides. We don't do it on the cruises, awesome. we've got to put it inside. <laughs> so we're here and I can't believe it, we've built this amazing truck and for me it really is about taking a dream really because that's what I do. I take dreams, I take old vehicles, I take someone's dream and we turn it into a reality. As it happened both Paul and I at the time were mid-ocean he was moving from his home in the UK to South Africa and I was in the throes of leaving South Africa to settle in England. So in a way I've come to say goodbye in the nicest possible way. Both our futures lay in the balance and I know Paul will back me up when I express my gratitude for that time spent in contemplation drawing strength from one another. This has been the most amazing trip. To be in a place like this is the pinnacle of all expeditions. This is magic this place. That's why we do it. This place takes your soul and it sets it free and it gives you space to think. It's done for 
five minutes. About three minutes. Yeah, thank you. And wasting no time in recording our CVs on video. I've spent most of my life in expedition travel. And I guess it started when I had a dream at about 10 years old. And that dream was to drive up through Africa. The trip took me one and a half years and 70,000 kilometers. I'm a storyteller. For example, these trees. Then I went to England and I set up a company there called Footloose 4x4. Footloose specialized in preparing people and the vehicles for overland travel. They're over a thousand years old. I was very privileged before I sold the business to actually build two vehicles for Shell. And we were going to film three documentaries. One was going to be in Siberia, one of the world's coldest places at minus 50 degrees. In China, one of the hottest deserts in the world. And in Malaysia, one of the toughest jungles to drive through. Found my niche, editing TV commercials. In England, when I wasn't preparing vehicles for my clients, I was on trips with classic cars and four-wheel drives, providing medical and mechanical support to these amazing trips. These old cars, we would drive them across continents, London to Sydney, Panama to Alaska, around the Mediterranean, down through South America. I guess I've been privileged enough to drive across every continent in the world. I love telling stories. I'm now back in South Africa, a place that I truly belong. Well, I, the only recent thing I couldn't get my head around was whether or not, with the space of this, whether it would be, it'd be big enough we could slip through it. I found that my soul really rests peacefully here, and I want to share my passion of travel with people who I know around the world will really enjoy some amazing trips and experiences in a place like this. It's incredible, and I invite you to join me sometime on a trip. I hoped at the time that he was actually making the invitation directly to me. Turns out, he was. I'm on my 14th day of an expedition to the most remote parts of all of southern Africa, in Hartman Valley, northern Namibia. We are waking from our ultra-low impact camp. My travelling companion, Paul Marsh, is making coffee. I think I'm getting coffee. <coughs> <laughs> uh, bacon and eggs. I know what I'd like. Some of those little chipolata sausages. Could you? Absolutely, could absolutely. you do that? Chipolatas. Next time. <laughs> You've obviously woken up from a dream. <laughs> I am in a dream. You're in a dream. I am in oh, a dream. The reality is that coffee's about it. Not a bad dream. Ah. Fantastic. Oh, you're taking it around that way, are you? <laughs> No idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, very and, funny. And your coffee's about <laughs> 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 Paul, do you want a rusk? No thanks. That's a pity I was going to put them over there. Yeah, this is hard work, and we've been sitting in a vehicle for the last week, and often people's backs aren't used to a whole lot of digging. So I'm very much inclined that when you dig, get down low on your knees and dig like this. If you bend over while you're digging, it can actually put a lot of extra stress on your backs. I think that maybe one car a month drives up here, maybe less. St. Pierre White, I presume. Nice to <laughs> yes. meet you. Fancy bumping into you here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Marsh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we succeeded. Let's stand here and have a shower. What a great idea that, that is. You just come across the oasis and actually it's quite important that you understand that this water is very valuable to the locals around. The last thing we want to do is get in here with our soap suds and contaminate the water. So I've got a basin, we collect some water, we can wash ourselves, we can rinse ourselves on the side, that's absolutely oh, fine. It's escaping! The bowl is escaping! Let me walk into the frame. Walk in a bit like, okay. Pretend it's ringing, walk in, hello, hello, and then... Hello? Hello? You want to speak to who? Oh. Andrew, call for you. Long distance call. Long distance. Hello? Hello? Ma Mother! Hello? 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 Cut off. <sighs> mother. Dear mother. She was like one of the family. And then joining us on the expedition is Paul Marsh and his partner Joe. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh well, great to Good see you, man. Hello, Gwen. Hello. How, are you doing? How are you? Good, thank you. 
done and what we've seen and the light and just the animals and then the rain came and we got that amazing smell it just brought all the smells out but you could smell the dung you could smell the trees you could smell the dust and you could see the rain just settle on the dust as it killed it it's just memories beautiful memory. what do you reckon as a campsite I think words like sublime and uh, really work. Try no, something else. Just incredible. The nah. best ever. Nah. It's Leave me here to die. Okay, you're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> he knows these waters like like the back of his hand. Big cliche, but he does. I've, yeah. what I've, right. I've got your rusks. Hang on, I've got one for you. Okay, two for you. That's good, healthy sand. Don't worry. Three for you. <laughs> Would you put up with this? <laughs> the road we're on now is long, twisty, and lumpy. This is where it was. That's where it's leaking from. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can plug that. We can fix it. Mm -hmm. Everyone is very happy, but for one thing. It is broke. Mm -hmm. Their jack just broke. As it happens, Paul to the rescue again. Okay, here we go, guys. Here's a, here's a present for you, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. We have two, so... Uh, <laughs> all right. He just happens yeah. to be carrying a brand new Toyota Jack. It's a spare in his truck. <laughs> it's uh, your trophy. Yeah, it's your trophy. You win the match. Trophy, <laughs> World Cup. <laughs> Meet Andrew. Hi Andrew. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I, I know this car. You know this car? Yes. A couple of years back it came on a trailer. The whole roof was flat. What we do you mean that the roof was flat? Yeah, it was a massive accident. We had to fit in the other roof and... Uh, so you fitted the roof and the, roof. the, the whole fender was cut off. And the back chassis part was bent. Well, that's not great news. No, not really. Is that why it was sprayed? I think so. Yeah, you can see all the markings. Ah, I uh, don't see any marks. What do you reckon? Eh? I don't know. Well, we did a good job. Well, the so job's not bad. Uh, it isn't bad. There's no you crack. Got a, yeah. you could, it didn't crack, which yeah. is good. I bet if we go on the inside, we'll find the welds. Mm -hmm. But you see, we should, we, we, we should we show him. Yeah. Yeah. We usually hide the welding so, yeah. so good. What uh, color was it before? Yellow, yeah. The yellow. I think so. Like a primer color. Because yeah. this is a silver car. It was, yeah. I know it's the same car. It is the same car. Yeah, absolutely. You sure? Mm. I should still have both of them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't honestly believe that that's the case. But the look on your face is priceless. This is not, this is not what I, how I was hoping to look at this moment. <laughs> oh, we had to catch you. We had to. It was too priceless to actually ask you. Mean you mean you're hitting me? We are absolutely taking that. <laughs> I couldn't you know, resist so, it. I you couldn't <coughs> resist it. <laughs> okay, full marks. But you do understand this is not going to go uh, go unanswered. Okay. Okay, and I will oh never trust God. you again. <laughs> it, it was just too tempting. Good one. I good really one. <laughs> As part of that first day's shooting back in 2013, I interviewed Paul with the idea that I'd have a before and after impression of the trip. You won't believe it, but I'm at the tip of this African continent. What an incredible place. This is home to me. I just think of these two incredible oceans coming down and meeting at the tip here. Well, there's a whole continent ahead of us to explore. You've done Trans-Africa before? 
I've done Trans-Africa three times. First time I was, I was 20, just on 20, with a passion to drive through Africa since I was about 10. And of course with sanctions and the government we had, we couldn't do it. Once the new government came in, all the doors opened up and my opportunity came. And we spent 14 months, my girlfriend at the time and myself, driving a Toyota Hilux 70,000 kilometers up and down through Africa. The most amazing experience you've ever believed. To believe there's life beyond South Africa and the people, the, the friendliness of the people, it just bowled me over. And that's why we took so long, we just loved it. So now, this, is your, this will be your fourth time? Fourth time, yeah. Fourth? Is it worth doing a fourth time? You know, every time you do it, Andrew, it's different. Things change. Africa's volatile. It keeps changing. That's, the, that's what brings the passion out in Africa. That's why we fall in love with Africa. If you've been to Africa once, you'll always come back. That's for sure. My heart is in Africa. I'm South African, but my heart is in true Africa. So going back and driving those same roads, which have probably changed a bit, seeing people, you have those magic experiences with people that money cannot buy. That's how I do it. So, um why, how do you think this is going to be different traveling with me? Obviously, I'm not comparing it with your girlfriend, but in terms of what other overland traveling that you've done before, because for me personally, it's an enormous opportunity to learn. Oh, look, we, we're both going to learn. I mean, if anything, I think you and I have topped our game and we are, we are learning from each other all the time. I learn from people traveling through Africa. I, you know, you're always learning. That's part of what I really love about this whole adventure. Uh, adventure travel is, is an, an adventure in itself and the whole process of learning is, is continuous. But you meet new people, you know, things that, that, that what you see scenery wise has changed, the light changes, the noises change. You know, it's just a completely new experience every time you go. And that, that, that's, that's never a, a, another time. I will be doing it again and again, probably till the day I can't drive anymore. Um, you've done a number of transcontinentals. Give me a quick list. I've driven from London to Sydney, uh, Panama to Alaska, top of uh, South America, Colombia to Terra del Fuego, and of course uh, transversed from Rio, Lima, and then Terra Fuego on a different trip back to Rio, and then circumnavigated the Mediterranean. Um, yeah, it's driven through Russia. I've driven from right down through Russia, all the way through Mongolia, China, all the way to Malaysia. So yeah, I've done some amazing traveling. And you've done, and you've built, you've built vehicles professionally. I have. I've, the vehicles that I've built have been, yes, I've prepared a vehicle for people, but I've actually built people's dreams. You now people used to come to me when I was in England, where I lived for 16 years, and they came with a dream, a dream, a passion, a desire, and and all I did is I facilitated that dream, which encompassed building the vehicle, training the people, giving them support. It was it was a privilege to do that for people, and I, I really miss that but it's something I will always treasure, those relationships we built and the challenges of turning a vehicle into something that was going to take these people on an incredible journey, probably something they will remember for the rest of their lives. So, absolutely. So now, you have to be absolutely honest. I want you to give me a strength and I want you to give me a weakness of this vehicle that I've built. Well, you've chosen a vehicle for sure. The Toyota brand is strong on Expedition because it's very well spread out around the world. It's a very simple vehicle. So in my books, I'm looking for simplicity, I'm looking for reliability, and I'm looking for safety. And safety comes back to the two other previously mentioned points. So, you know, this is my ultimate vehicle that you have here. I think what you've, what you've encompassed in, in how the layout has worked, the design, uh, it will take you to wherever you want to go with, I would imagine, very, very few problems along the route. This is a workhorse for you. This is your vehicle that you use day in, day out you know, building these magnificent programs. You couldn't have chosen a better vehicle. So there's always going to be personal preferences that creep into people's choice of vehicle. But still, I will go back to my same old basics. Is it going to be reliable? You've got to build a safe vehicle. And you've got to make sure that you get out there and enjoy the trip in the best possible way. So yeah, you have... Weaknesses? Um, weaknesses? I really have to think, really. You know, there's not many on these because they are so well tested through Africa. In terms of the way I've laid it out and, you know, modified it. Um, I think in some areas you might look at a bit more security. You've got the film on the windows, which is good. 
but if someone can get into the car, you know, then they, they, you've got to have a consideration that they can get access to anything that's in the car. So that would be probably the, my only thought on this vehicle. You've got recovery, you can extricate your vehicle out of pretty much any situation, I'd imagine, with help of local people, I'm sure. Uh, the layout is really well laid out. You can live in there, you can sleep in there, you can actually be encompassed in this capsule for any length of time, should you choose to be. You don't have a toilet on board, so <laughs> you've got to get outside to go and do the necessary. But uh, no, that would be my only sort of thought, would be maybe to consider a bit more weakness, maybe another hatch on this side, which would give you a bit more access. Because really, when you're building a vehicle, it's not about putting every last gizmo and gadget in the vehicle. It's really about keeping it very, very simple. And everything you put in that you build into these vehicles and either drawers or shelves or whatever you use has got to be put in a way that you can access it. If you can't access it, you are not going to use it. Besides the fact you've got all the time in the world, you just won't make that effort to go and unpack something because it's, it's a time-consuming hassle. So access is key. Um, so yeah, I think you've, you've, you've hit 98% of what anyone could want out of a vehicle in this. There are going to be a few preferences that people would choose, but they'd be personal preferences. Small. But for me, my association with Paul culminated in one of the most epic trips of my entire life in 2017. The Canning Stock Route. 1,000 kilometers off-road. There will be no settlements, no farms, We'll probably see a few other vehicles, but empty wilderness for 1,000 kilometers. Actually more like 1,600 kilometers of unbroken wilderness Look, it's gonna drop down onto the bottom axle. in Western Australia. Someone's got to dig a hole here. And it's not even for my vehicle or my tent getting it left. Oh, come on, just, you get oh, fed, don't you? Okay. Get on with it. Do I get a beer at the end of this? Damn, I hope so. Only one. Yeah. Luckily for you, yes. Otherwise, no beer. <laughs> Jiggy bugger. No, you're one degree off. Sorry, no beer. Done. 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 Well Definitely done. done. Yes, it, was, it was like lightning. <laughs> Still got to zip this up though. Good. Done. Good. Done. So that dead camel shut himself and dropped dead. But it is definitely one of those click tick box items in Australian overlanding. And I've just done it as my very first Australian outback experience. And I'm overwhelmed. On right, on right. Yeah. And now left. For our final campsite, we've chosen an elevated table of bare red rock where the intensity of the setting sun is unfettered. Not for me.